I'm Susan Schwalm. Many of you know me, but for those who, wow. who don't, I'm an artist, a Silver Point specialist, and a longtime friend of Cynthia. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this informal Zoom event. Many of us have just learned this program in the last six months, and I'm sure there'll be some glitches, but we'll do our best to make everything run smoothly. We've got everybody muted, I hope, except the speakers, and expect, except me and Susan Platt, who's co-hosting co or emceeing this meeting for me. And um, after Cynthia died, a small group of us who learned about her death began to work to get obituaries and then to coordinate this Zoom meeting. And many of the speakers tonight were part of this original group, which includes, but not exclusively, Howard Dina Pindell, Cassandra Langer, Susan Platt, Douglas Shear, Jessica Siegel, that's daughter of Judy Siegel, two nieces, Linda Halwar and Leslie McCaver, and Carrie Grimsby. And I especially want to thank people from ICA who helped to get the New York Times um, obituary and the WCA and the CAA for networking on a lot of these things. So hopefully we won't have too many glitches and that we'll hear some great stories and tales. And before I hand you over to Susan Platt, um, um, I just wanted to um, mention that um, who will MC the program, sorry. I got distracted because somebody tried to call me here who I think wants to be in the meeting, but I don't know if she's having trouble. Um, yeah. It's been a rocky little week here with personal issues. So I've asked her to do the emceeing that I just didn't have time to focus on. Um, I met Cynthia in 1973 through Women in the Arts. I was young, very young, and she swooped me up on the first night. And um, I worked with her on Women in the Arts and with, on so many projects over the years. I just have one cute story to tell you about Cynthia, which she told me very early in our relationship. And which is that as most girls kept, not me of course, but many kept um, scrapbooks of movie stars Cynthia, when she was a teenager, kept a scrapbook of women artists. And I have always, I never saw the scrapbook. And I, someday, hopefully it'll turn up and somebody will, will, will show it. But, you know, that, that is what is really special about Cynthia. So I want to hand the meeting over to Susan Platt. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Okay, so... Let's see. There we go. If you want to see me bigger, you can put it on speaker view. <laughs> so has she turned it over? Yes, you're, you're I'm, on. I'm still seeing you as the no, speaker. You're, you're there, Susan. Okay, as long as I'm there, it doesn't matter. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'm Susan Platt, and I am thrilled to be here for this celebration of the life and work of Cynthia Navaretta honoring her many achievements as a feminist, publisher, art critic, curator, administrator, and friend. She was an active member of the College Art Association, the International Association of Art Critics, also known as ICA, as well as a founding member of the Women's Caucus for Art, the Coalition of Women's Arts Organizations, and Women in the Arts. Navarrete also created her own publishing firm, Mid-March Arts Press, and she published over 50 books, which you can still see on her website today. It's an amazing range of publications. The Women Artist Newsletters were pioneering publications from the mid 1970s. She was a tireless advocate and networker for women artists throughout the country and the world. Cynthia Greenberg was born on January 31st, 1923 in the Bronx. Her father Morris owned some of Manhattan's first parking garages and her mother Sophia was a homemaker. This is all Cynthia, bullshit. What? Cynthia studied at the University of Wisconsin and New York University before entering a bachelor's degree at Columbia University in 1946 and a master's degree in mechanical engineering there in 1948. 
unbelievable, right? She worked for, among others, Alfred and Swift, a heating and cooling contractor, designing systems for major projects, including for some of the structures at the 1964 World's Fair. But if engineering was her career, rare for a woman at the time, art was her passion. In 1953, she married Emmanuel Navaretta, a painter who was part of the abstract expressionist circle that emerged in the late 1940s. And in included household names like Jackson Pollock and Franz Klein. It was largely a man's world, as she recalled in 1977, when she introduced an artist talk on art panel discussion called Women Artists of the 50s. Quote, it was very male, male dominated. Women were there to be danced with and to listen and be full of admiration and adulation. Susan Schwab said in the New York Times obituary, in the 1970s, it was a very difficult time for women artists. Dealers, if you could talk to, if they would talk to you at all, often said they didn't show women or that collectors weren't interested in buying women's work or that there were no women artists. All of us presenting here today benefited from her efforts on behalf of creative women and some men over a lifetime that forwarded the cause of women's liberation and equality. Indeed, our many and diverse voices attest to her extraordinary contributions in life. I want to express my appreciation, especially to Susan Schwab, for her undertaking and energizing our community in organizing this event, who, because of family issues, is not going to be a co-host. I also want to acknowledge Rico Takata's amazing effort in organizing a meet and greet, honoring Cynthia at her apartment for 25 women during the 2017 CAAWCA conference. A record of Cynthia's apartment at that time, filmed by Helen Poole, is included after the slideshow. As many of you know, Cynthia always refused to have a WCA honor award, so this was as close as she got to being honored during her lifetime. Today, of course, we honor all her amazing achievements. For those of you who are not part of the list of official speakers, I invite you to put your name in the chat if you'd like to make a short contribution at the end of the scheduled speakers. You're also welcome to write a brief personal memory there about Cynthia. Our uh, speakers will begin, let's see, now, where do we go? Next, first speaker. Oh, I have a little, I have a little brief memory, I almost forgot to read it. <laughs> Um, as an art historian and art critic, I got to know Cynthia well in the mid-1990s after she offered to publish my book on art and politics in the 1930s. It came out in 1999. I had no idea of all she was doing until I self-published a book this year. She hired an editor, a copy editor, a designer, shepherded it through the printing process, handled the distribution, and paid for everything. She amazing woman. She also published a second book of mine in 2011, Art and Politics Now. In those years, art and politics was not yet the accepted idea that it is today. So it is just one example of her pioneering approach to publishing when she took me on. At that time, I was living alone in Seattle and quite isolated, so her support meant a huge amount to me. During those years and continuing until just before her death, we had frequent lengthy lunch meetings, both at her favorite Chinese restaurant and at her apartment, a real oasis of art, as you will all see shortly. We also discussed the art world and the latest events. On one occasion, after she had already taken one of her first falls and used a walker, we took the bus from near her apartment on the Upper West Side all the way to Washington Square to the Gray Art Gallery for an opening of feminist art performance. Several of these artists knew her well. After, we waited in the pouring rain to take the bus back. My other main memory of Cynthia was assisting her with the College Art Association book display, which was always close to the entrance because of her clout with the organization. It was an informal meeting place, as you will hear more of from others, for many people, a delightful, casual, three-day, drawn-out series of conversations, old friends and new. She was cheery and full of humor and intelligence right up until the end of her life, and I miss her a great deal. So that's my short memory now. We will turn to Dorothy. Oh, I Sinclair. thought we're playing the, the, the video, the images, Susan. 
What? We're doing this slideshow. Oh, right, right. Um, what did I say I was going to do? I forgot. Oh, right, the slideshow, right. <laughs> Sorry. Slideshow. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Please don't leave. <laughs> no, no, I'm not leaving. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to call your attention here. These are some of her many books that she published. Voices of Women was had an introduction with Lucy Lepard, and it was an extraordinary idea to have three critics commenting on three poets commenting on three artists. It was just an amazing concept. Also, she was a pioneer in the publishing of uh, the photography art history by women. This is one volume of two that she published. The book, um, Mutiny in the Mainstream, you're going to be hearing from Jessica, uh, Judy Siegel's daughter, and this is the cover of that amazing book. Beyond Walls and Wars is the book that is based on a conference that Kim Levin organized, and you'll be hearing about that also. Beyond Modernism in the Pacific Northwest suggests her reach to other parts of the country, and she did a whole series of books on artists, women artists in other parts of the country outside of New York. Gumbo Yaya, I, uh, we will be hearing more about this absolutely extraordinary groundbreaking anthology of African-American women artists. And the Kara Walker is one of several publications on that subject. And you can see if you can read Kara Walker, no, Kara Walker, yes, Kara Walker, question mark, the controversy of Kara Walker and publishing this book again shows Cynthia's guts. Okay, on we go. Okay, I'll talk a minute about these books also. Uh, Howardina Pindell uh, will be not with us because she has a major one-person show coming up, but this is the um, one of several books that Cynthia published by her. But Women Artists of Italian Futurism Almost Lost to History, an incredible act of research on the Italian futurist women. I won't bother to talk about my two books. I already mentioned them. This is about the Women Artists of Surrealism. Uh, uh, another big topic in several of her publications, and a memoir by Louise Strauss Ernst, Max Ernst's first wife, who actually died in the Holocaust. And this is a, a journal that she kept for two years right before she was sent off and, and, was, and, and sent to the uh, concentration camps at the very end of the war. So it's an enormously important book.
Wow. That makes those of us that spend a lot of time there very sad, and we wonder what happened to all that art. Well, it's nice to see it's the nice space. To see. It's wonderful to have that record, and thanks to Rico Takata for locating this fabulous movie. Okay, Susan, introduce our first speaker. All right, thank you, Susan. Our first speaker is Dorothy Sinclair. Dorothy is an actress who has spent most of her 94 years in Los Angeles. She has been a book critic, a public relations coordinator for the William Morris Agency, a grandmother, and a dog lover, partial to dachshunds. Dorothy's two memoirs, You Can Take the Girl Out of Chicago and The Promise at the Dairy Queen can be purchased online. Okay, Dorothy. Am I on? Yes. Because uh, I said, I, I did unmute. <laughs> did it right? You're there good. Go, um, Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I learned a lot. I thought I knew everything about Cynthia, but Susan, I learned a lot that I didn't know. In 1945, I was about to receive my BA degree at the University of Wisconsin. That was when Cynthia came into my life. She was a grad student in engineering from New York City. Wait a minute. A grad student? Engineering 1945? No, 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 no. There had to be some mistake. I soon found out that there wasn't. She was the real deal, right? Beautiful, sophisticated, and open to accepting a little English major from Chicago as a friend. And friends, we were right from the start. I'm not sure why, because on the surface we had little in common. So how to explain a relationship that would endure for three quarters of a century. Hmm. Oh, I'm going to try not to cry through this thing. <laughs> uh, well, I should confess that the one thing that Sin and I did find we had in common right away was we like boys. Pretty soon she moved into an apartment on Langdon Street with a fourth year male medical student. Un heard of in those days. When school ended, we decided to rent a summer house in Woodstock together. But Woodstock at that time was just a small woodsy village filled with artists and musicians and summer theater. You saw us when they rolled the pictures. We were in batik dirndl skirts and off the shoulder uh, peasant blouses, popular in that time. Soon Stim Sin soon put her engineering degree to use when she was hired by a large firm willing to take a chance on a young woman. Though she worked hard at her new career, plumbing engineering was never her real passion, no. She was delighted because we missed each other. I was in Chicago and so she was delighted when I, I married a Chicago medical student who was about to start an internship at Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn. This was post-war, 1950. A terrible housing shortage, impossible to find an affordable apartment in New York. No worries, I told everybody. I've got a friend, a good friend. She lives in New York City. She'll just take a subway to Brooklyn and she will find her girlfriend a charming New York apartment close to Kings County Hospital. <laughs> Looking back, I can only be amazed at my chutzpah at asking such a request. And also I'm amazed at Cynthia's willingness to take it on with, right from the start. Nothing was ever too difficult for our Cynthia and no challenge nor favor too great for a friend. Two and a half years and one, uh, it's two years and one and a half babies later, my husband and I exchanged the ice and snow oh. and we settled in Los Angeles. Now be glad of long distance phone calls that would go on for half an hour almost every day for almost half a century. What could we have found to talk about so much for so long? I don't know anything, everything, family events, gossip, just like most besties. Certainly not her job, 
which she considered boring. Little time passed before Sin spoke of the art world, clearly the one she loved and wanted to inhabit. She was intrigued by many brilliant, gifted female artists, how their work was being overlooked, unfairly neglected. At her office, she had a dedicated personal secretary and she had unlimited access to a Xerox machine. So before long, my energetic friend was publishing what become a groundbreaking achievement, the Women's Artist Newsletter. After meeting Emmanuel Navarrete, the abstract expressionist, she lost interest in any other romance. Emmanuel was everything Cynthia wanted, brilliant, erudite, funny, unquestionably talented. Of course, he was Italian. But that was a good thing, because being Italian meant he could cook. Of course he could cook. Could he ever? And a husband who was a chef worked well for a lady engineer with a midtown office. It meant that the pasta would be ready and waiting as Sin Subway chugged to a stop at 105th Street. Waiting, too, was little son Miles, named for Cynthia's favorite trumpet player. Once a year, I would be treated to the company of Sin and Miles as they flew for a visit to LA. We would take off to explore the California coast from San Diego to Calistoga, enjoying the scenery while all the while, I never stopped trying to convince my friend Cynthia that California artists really did have some talent. She never believed me. She was such a superb New Yorker. When her marriage fell apart, she was heartbroken. She was disappointed, she was confused, but she was never defeated. For the rest of her life, she maintained that beautiful Riverside Drive apartment you've seen as, as a home for herself and for her many beloved Siamese cats, as an office, a, a gallery, and my personal Airbnb. The little room off the kitchen was always ready for me whenever worker play took me into New York. Launching Ben Marsh Publishing Company was the fulfillment of a dream. Can any of you really appreciate what hard work that meant? Each book that finally went to print was like the birth of a new baby, Cynthia's child. She never missed a year of displaying her books, network at the ABA convention, and I never missed a year of sitting beside her to help ban her booth. In between conventions where I was abroad to enjoy more art, I would beg her to take time out for lunch with me to enjoy a bistro where, where we could dine or just people watch, but no, no, lunch for Cynthia. <laughs> Day left over from breakfast, wrapped in a paper napkin. We shared many foreign hotel rooms, but the one thing we never shared was lunch. As I would leave for a matinee or concert or shopping spree, Finn would check off one art museum after another. If she hurried, she might be able to catch another exhibit before closing time perhaps even another museum. And Cynthia Nandaretta never saw a museum she didn't love. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, oh, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. So Thank you. you really covered so many important aspects of Cynthia's life. It's just great. All right. Uh, now our next speaker is Jessica Siegel. I don't know who Terry Grant's IP is. <laughs> there we go. Jessica, there she is. I'm going to introduce you, Jessica. An act, no, sorry, an award-winning NYU journalism professor who uses science and history to investigate health and cultural myths. Her mother, Judy Siegel, was founding editor of the Women Artists News, of which you saw some in the slideshow, 
and editor of Mid-March's Mutiny and the Mainstream Talk That Changed Art, 1975 to 1990, of which you saw the cover in the slideshow. Judy Siegel was an editor, painter, photographer, and Pratt and ICP lecturer who later founded the World Journal of Post-Factory Photography about antiquarian avant-garde photography. Jessica is a daughter of Women Artist News as its first distributor, carrying issues to downtown bookstores in her bicycle basket as a high schooler. Executive of her mother's photographic art and Women Artist News document collection, Jessica welcomes archive and curator help and connection. Okay, Jessica. Thank you so much. Uh, Dorothy, you may know me, but I don't know you. And that may be the same with some of you, because I was the teenager slouching around the house when my mother, uh, Judy Siegel, and Cynthia got together in, 19, in 1975 to found the Women Artist News. And as you know, and we saw the amazing uh, cover art, and by the way, that was very well done. I really hats off to you guys for pulling this together. It's really... <laughs> I know how hard it is. I'm teaching on Zoom right now. Congratulations on making that happen. Anyway, um, my mother, as the founding editor, was the editor, artist, and ink-stained wretch at the keyboard. Cynthia was the publishing visionary and the art world savvy uh, impresaria. And that's how I remember them. And as you heard in the introduction, I was actually Juan's first distributor. I didn't think of it quite that way because I would just bring it around to indie bookstores. Uh, in those days, there were a lot of indie bookstores on my bicycle and drop it off on the shelf. And that was my first reluctant, I should say, introduction to the world of art because I was not interested. Um, and that's sort of like life coming around full circle. So I would put it on the shelf and I would see visual what was going on in the art world because there was the giant art forum with all the men and the advertising and the power. It was very clear. You could just see it. And there at the time in the 70s, there were only two women's artist publications. There may have been others, but that's what I saw at the bookstores. This is my report from the front lines, 1976, 77. And the other one was Heresies. And I actually went and looked up and some of the same women were involved. So some of you people may have been with Heresies. It was actually thicker and more colorful because in the early days, um, the Women of the Artist News was sort of a, this, thin, this thin little newsletter with tiny type. And when I was actually trying to look at it to sort of give you all some highlights, I was like, this type is too small. It was when the Mac came out in like 1984 that it really started to get colorful and that's when you saw the colorful uh, pictures. So I thought at the time, you know, maybe I should push this competitor heresies out of the way because I just want the Women Artist News to be in the front and sort of arrange it. But then even then I realized that there were only two and they needed to be together and I needed to support heresies too, whoever they were. So I would arrange them both, collect the money, and then go home. And that was the job. I got to keep the money. But the point was to get the publication out there. Um, back in those days, just sort of remembering uh, the Women Artists News and the gang who made it, I know that some of you here were in and out of my mother's house. Um, they it took over the family living room in our Greenwich Village Brownstone. And folks, I'm in the Greenwich Village Brownstone. I live on the third floor now and I am sitting in my mother's studio. I'm just gonna show you the art here. I, it's pretty much a mess. It's as she left it, she died in 2017. Um, but this is where the art happened. The magazine happened on the first floor. My best friend from high school remembered, she's like, oh yeah, all those ladies were there. They had consciousness raising, they were very angry. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, they were very angry, absolutely. Um, I remember just Cynthia, and I'm, I know that everyone who loved her remembers her this way too, but from my vantage from like the gritty New York view, and my mom was in denim with paint on her, and it was all old, and I was just this kind of snotty kid. I, I think I was a little sassy, but I was certainly selling some of those years in there. Um, but Cynthia was in the silk scarves. She was very elegant. She had cheekbones. It was like uptown cheekbones, and she seemed to have this amazing insider savoir faire. I did not understand what this savoir faire was 
And it's actually through now hearing you talk and learning about her that I really started to get the picture. And I remember my mom talking about this thing called the club. And there was like these modernism, this formalist stuff that I, that I heard about in college. And it's now that I'm getting, oh, they had a lock. Um, and the Women Artists News was, of course, going up against that lock. And I want to tell you, I was hoping not to absorb those things back then. I remember talks about like Joan Semmel and giant penises and whatever it was, I didn't want to hear about it because it wasn't writing. But I want to tell you a key moment in my life about how this stuff seeped into me. And it's because of Cynthia's vision that made this publication happen. And my mother also came to flower as an editor and a writer. She had been an artist in her own right, but this is where she really flowered. And she, for anyone here who was edited by my mother, I, I can't see you all, but if you want to raise your hand, I have the file of her letters and I just want to say, sorry, oh my God. The edits were so harsh and that's how I became a really good editor. It was brutal early on. But I just want to tell you this one moment of my art education because of you guys and them. In 2010, when I stood in front of Artemis Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith at the Capo di Monte in Napoli, I burst out crying because the painting was giant, it was magnificent, it was overwhelming. And that's what I'd heard growing up from Cynthia and from my mother, that there had been great women artists. And I want to tell you guys, I don't think I really believed it. I thought that Jansen, that book I brought home that my mother was incensed about and later became a cover story in the Women Artists News because there were no women in there. I was like, maybe there really were no great women artists. You know, it's possible. So I'm standing in front of this painting. I'm just like, oh my God, it's the art is so great. And that was sort of a key moment for me coming back around to returning to my youth and this knowledge that was imparted to me. Um, my mother was diagnosed in, with Alzheimer's in 2010, around the time that I saw this painting of Judith. And my mother is Judith. And so I felt this like weird connection. And around then, Cynthia called me out of the blue. Like I had not talked to her in a few years. Um, and she says to me, Jessica, I need you to do me a favor, as if like years had not passed. I was like, okay, what is that? She says, I have, there's a box of books in the basement, in your mother's basement, that has copies of my books in it that she was storing for me. And I'm like, I knew there was a lot of stuff down there and it was pretty cluttered, but I kind of started doing some cleaning up. I was like, I don't think there's a, a box of books like that. I'm really, really sorry. Um, and she says, nope, there's a box of books. I thought, ah, oh, she's kind of losing it. There's no books. Um, and one of the books that she said was in this box was Mutiny in the Mainstream, which uh -huh. you have seen. Um, and that is Talk That Changed Your Art 1975 to 1990. And it anthologizes many of the panel coverage that was in the Women Artists News. My mother would sit there and polish it up and edit it up and they put them together. They took stuff from other things as well. And Cynthia told me at the time, she was archiving her work. She was getting things to the Smithsonian and to elsewhere. And she wanted to give this book to, to people who should have it, a library, a museum, stuff. It, you know, it was now being used as sort of a reference in, in history, in women artist history, but I hadn't seen it. And the last thing that Cynthia Navarretta said to me was, Jessica, you need to take care of your mother's art legacy. My mother was very, sick with Alzheimer's at the time. And I know that there are many people here who are caretakers. Susan, you've been struggling with that. Others of you here, we're not young anymore. I mean, it's tired and I was exhausted and I didn't know what she meant. Jessica, well, I hope you could wrap this up a little bit. Yes, I found the books and later I went back to say, okay, Cynthia, who should I give these books to? And she basically said to me, Jessica, you've come too late. Were you gonna tell us who, uh, that, did you finally figure out who you were supposed to give the books to? Well, thank you for asking. I did not find out who I was supposed to give the books to. And Cynthia said to me, uh, you came too late, but what I wanted to wrap up with 
was that I don't think I came too late because I'm here with you all. Thank you, Jessica, for that wonderful presentation with so many personal details. Next, we will hear from Linda Hulkauer, Cynthia's niece, and writer of The Suburban Pioneer Woman, New York City foodie, and political shit stirrer. Her essay will be read by Cassandra Langer. Hi, I'm Cassandra Langer, and I'm reading this statement for Cynthia's niece, Linda. You only live once, but what a life my aunt Sin lived. Here are some special memories culled from my life with my aunt in no particular order. She had an unquenchable curiosity and wonder about the world. She loved chocolates and especially candied orange peels dipped in dark chocolate from Mondell's on Upper Broadway. Her fashion ethos was simple elegance. She loved silk chanton and sherbet and lavender tones and prints only appeared on her poochie dresses or the silk scarves that she chicly draped around her shoulders. She was a snob about art, but not about people. She chatted up everybody and was truly engaged by each of their stories. Traveling with her was not for the faint of heart. Her energy was inexhaustible and her mission was to visit every gallery, museum, church, or building of architectural import. Few could keep up with her boundless passion or determination. She didn't suffer fools at all and seems to have encountered her fair share. In elementary school, she broke the New York State record for the 20-yard dash. A coach approached her mother and asked permission to train Cynthia to be a competitive runner. But Sophie firmly stated, and I quote, she's a girl, girls don't do that, unquote. Later, she would not allow Sin to attend medical school because, and I quote, that wasn't what nice girls did, unquote. She never wanted a conventional life. Over the years, she would refresh that conviction often by telling me about all the women from her childhood who had married very boring doctors and dentists and moved to the suburbs. The term factorum was invented to describe Sin's roles in Midmarch Art Press. Her duties were soup to nuts, ranging from brainstorming the concepts of the books with authors to hawking them at the CAA or schlepping them in a metal shopping cart to the neighborhood post office on Amsterdam and 104th Street. Her favorite choice of personal chariots to toll around the city were the 104 and the number five buses. Taxis were considered an indulgence. She was thrifty, even to the level of lightly crypt clipping uncanceled postage off incoming mail and gluing it onto outgoing mail. We were always expecting to get the news of her arrest for a class A felony. Marrying Emmanuel, she became part of the historic New York School of Artists, but she was never content to be just the wife of an artist. Her dining room buffet was a tableau of more of Russian icons, ceramic objects dark, and those festive Mexican candelabra. It served double duty as a sideboard and dining table and was a veritable movable feast of activity. One moment, an executive board meeting desk. The next, a generous dinner table spread with delights from Hunan balcony. I called her daily for a hundred days following my marriage's sudden and devastating end. The telephone allowed me to cross several state lines and the sound of her voice gave me a safe place for my fears. As I nervously paced around the lake at my end of the world, the sheer comfort of her voice gave me a shoulder to cry on even though I knew that I had robbed her of her morning ritual. The one hour she reserved to eat her breakfast in bed and read the New York Times from cover to cover. 
Even so, she never cut me short, but instead extended the luxury of her intention, even though veering off her schedule was torturous for her. Her generosity poked through in large and small increments and sometimes in the most unexpected places. At her house in Springs, she cut the grass with the scissors and the deafening sounds of her beloved Siamese cats remain vividly earmarked in my memory as gangs of them bounded through the apartment hallway en route to the kitchen at mealtime. Among the art memories I cherish, Sin and June Wayne were great friends. Sin had a print of June's, a whimsical pastel colored image of a frilly bra hanging over her nightstand where she could see it every morning. When June had a one woman show out in the Hamptons, I believe it was at Guildhall, Sin asked me to cater a post art opening party at her house. It was a raucous affair. June let us each choose a print as a thank you for our contribution to her special weekend celebration. On another evening, we went to the Rene and Kayam Gross house to hear a lecture that was organized by his widow, Rene. Sin knew Rene well. Sin was using a walker at that point. We were seated right behind the speaker in her slide projector. The woman was ill-prepared and an inexperienced presenter. What should have been an hour presentation at most dragged on and on and on. In the dark room, we were all starting to feel like hostages. And suddenly, as the next slide was locked and loaded, a voice cried out, and I quote, what a bore. This is going to go on way too long. I'm leaving, of course. That voice belonged to Sin. She then shot up out of her seat and started to struggle to extract her walker, which was lodged between the chairs. Once freed, she looked down and summoned us to, and I quote, come on. She plowed her way towards the exit through the shadowed, stunned sea of people and unabashedly passed the widow's furious face. My boyfriend and I trailed sheepishly behind. Chutzpah, thy name is Cynthia. She was complicated. For many years, she was against the creation of the National Museum for Women in the Arts in DC. When she was approached to be a founding member of the museum's board, she demurred, as she feared the museum would further ghettoize women artists. Later, she admitted that she was wrong and gave it full-throated support. She created agency in her universe and exploited it repeatedly to lift up others, often at her own expense. Her voluminous files housed decades of women artists' memorabilia, and during her last years were donated to the Smithsonian Archives, where they are available today. As her health and mobility declined, she made her wishes known. That once she couldn't read the New York Times or feed herself, that was the time she wanted to exit. She lived life by her own terms, and she wanted to die that way. With her death, an historic era of the art world ended too. She was among the last living witnesses to the New York school's crazy, wild, and brilliant ride. I can still hear her outrage as she read books and articles on the epoch, mangled by young scholars who had heard all the stories second and third hand. I quote, this is outrageous. They got it all wrong. That never happened, she would snipe. She liked accuracy. She liked the unvarnished truth. As I wrote this all down, I wanted to get it right for her. I hope I got it right. Thank you, Linda, for that wonderful personal story. It was really, really important for us to have that family perspective. Okay, our next speaker is Leslie King Hammond, who is PhD Professor Emerita at the Maryland Institute College of Art 
and was the former Dean of Graduate Studies and founding director of the Center for Race and Culture. Judy, can you switch to Leslie King Hammond? There she is. All right. Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. This is wonderful. This is as Cynthia would have wanted it, a true celebration of all that Cynthia was. But my beginnings with Cynthia were very, very different. Um, I didn't meet Cynthia right away. I had had contact with Emmanuel Navarretta. And Emmanuel was a artist, uh, excuse me, artist and um, critic in residence at um, Maryland Institute College of Art in the Hofberger School with Braith Hardigan. And we would meet because I had just been recently appointed Dean of the Graduate School. And Emmanuel was absolutely fascinated meeting me and I was fascinated meeting him. And we would have wonderful, wonderful conversations. He was just a bolt of energy all the time and always something new to learn. So that was like the late seventies. By the eighties, when I started to go to the College Art Association meetings with regularity, I finally met Cynthia. And Cynthia says, I know you. And I said, how do you know me? She said, because I am married to Emmanuel Neveretta. And Cynthia and I, it was as if we had been friends our entire lives. She never missed a beat. Cynthia was open, she was energetic, she was just a ball of fire and funny. The one thing I have not heard people talk about is her amazing sense of humor. She was also a little bit of a trickster and she was also quite mischievous. And because she was so um, centered on who she was and what she was trying to achieve, she did not suffer fools lightly. And so she and I got along very well because at that time in my life, as a young art historian, as a young, very young, um, um, new uh, administrator running a graduate school for the first time, which I had not ever anticipated doing in my life, Cynthia became like a godmother. She was um, a fierce warrior. She was unintimidated. She was fearless in ways that left an impression on me so that as I began to embrace the challenges I would meet, Cynthia always left that kind of imprint on me about how to handle business in a very male-centric world. Ah, boy, that's as nice. we began to develop our relationship, I began to understand that every time I went to the College Art Association meeting, which was an arduous task yeah, for those of you who had been there. It became the high point of my conference to go and see Cynthia, to sit and talk with her. Because the other amazing thing about Cynthia was that Cynthia could talk to anyone about anything without intimidation and with clarity. Cynthia was very aware of the challenges that women were facing. She was especially sensitive, empathetic, and aware, highly attuned to the challenges that African-American women artists were facing. So at one point, she had already begun the project to assemble an anthology on African-American women artists. And she was, you know, how she would get when she was in the throes of birthing a new baby. She was very, very, very focused on attention to detail. And she didn't really have a name for the book, but, and she didn't really have uh, uh, um, someone to write the foreword. And she was looking for somebody to write the foreword of the book. So Cynthia and I began to talk. And the more I talked to Cynthia, the more I was giving her information. And the next thing I know, Cynthia looks at me, she says, you're writing the book. You're writing the, uh, it is, this is going to be you. You are going to do this. Well, I thought I was just going to be doing a little forward until I saw the book published. And there's my name all over the front cover. I said, Cynthia, what did you do? She just looked at me with that smirk on her face. She was so proud of herself. She was like, oh, like the, the cat that ate the little mouse. I did it. I did what I wanted to do. And I, at the time, 
I said, this is a learning curve, Leslie. This woman is on a mission. She will not be stopped. So it's best you get in league with her because this is not the kind of person that you want against you. You want to ride this wave with her because basically you're both on the same path, doing the same kind of work, committed to the same kind of cause. Because every time I saw Cynthia or called her or, or wrote her a letter or an email eventually, Cynthia was right on top of every issue. Cynthia was on point. So as the years went on and this book became a kind of staple, a standard, before I knew it, as time has passed and I lost contact with Cynthia once I, I rolled out of um, not being in the CAA as active as I was because I went on to become the secretary and then the vice president and then the president of the CAA and, and that had its own challenges. But every year I was there to see Cynthia, to make sure she would give me kind of like, it was like a flu shot. She would fortify me so that I could move forward. But as the years went on, I did not realize the impact, the profound impact that that book, Gumbo Yaya, would have because it became one of the very first anthologies to recognize, to give visibility, to give affirmation and agency to the numerous women of color who were out there working hard, working collectively, feminists before feminism was even recognized or acknowledged as an entity that we would always have to deal with, leading all the way up to now to our Me Too movement. These women were the foundation and Cynthia was there. She was a catalyst. She was, you know, as John Lewis said, she made good trouble. She always had good trouble on her mind and in her heart and used all of her energies to that end. So today, as I look at the impact of the work that she has done on so many levels, with so many publications, with so many artists, writers, and critics, I am only too humbled to have been part of her circle and only sad that I did not live in New York closer to where she was so that I could have shared more time with her. But I am blessed and I am thankful and I am so, so, so um, overwhelmed at the impact that her presence has had in my professional life and I will honor and celebrate that always. Thank you. Oh, thank oh, you wonderful. so much. Thank you. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. Yay. We can all put in little applauses, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have to ask, we are starting, because we started a little late, these things take longer. Anybody who's speaking in the next, that we have to kind of try to keep to five minutes or less if we can. I need mm -hmm. to be, I need to t t turn on my timer. I, I am really unable to stop people because everyone is so interesting. Don't but worry, I, Susan, you just introduce <laughs> them. I'll stop them. Okay, thanks, Susan. Perfect partnership. Our next important speaker is Katie Deepwell. If uh, Judith could put her Hi. camera on Katie. There she is, all the way from London in the middle of the night or something. <laughs> uh, well, it's pretty late. It's just gone midnight here. Editor um, but and I'm owner. really pleased to be able to talk at this event. And so um, I introduce you, Katie, or do you want to just go ahead? That'll save yeah, time. Just go ahead. Yeah, great. Save us all two minutes. Um, I um, uh, I met many of you through the CAA book fair, and um, uh, I want to explain that the first book, here is my copy, that this is the first book I ever purchased, and it was from Cynthia herself at the Women's Caucus at um, San Antonio in 1995, and that was the first time I was in America, and it was the first time I met Cynthia. And... Uh, just like um, Leslie has pointed out, uh, I regularly went back to the book fair and over the years when I went to other events, over a couple of years, um, to Women's Caucus and to College Art Association and I went to see Cynthia in the book fair, I became friends with her. So when I started um, N Paradoxa um, and uh, had this opportunity to think about going to America and selling it in America, 
Cynthia and I developed this partnership. So for about 15 years from the 90s right through the 2000s, we were partners at the CAA Book Fair every year. And um, because of that, we, we spent three very intense days together every year, every February at that annual meeting. And um, I, um, as a result, I visited her flat many times and it was very nice to see all those pictures of the flat. Um, I often stayed there both before and after her cats were there because they were only there for a while and then they moved to the country. And uh, once she actually came to my house in London. So it was nice to be able to be reciprocally, you know, the host. And she came to a party that I'd organized for an art critics Congress. The other time I met her in um, over, you know, 20 years, we were friends and we would meet every year and spend a lot of time together during the CAA book fair. But uh, she, I also met her in Poland where she went and attended another ICA Congress with Kim Levin and um, Phyllis, uh, another ICA member. Um, and that was a very memorable trip where we went to uh, Warsaw and Krakow. So I just wanted to say a few things about, um, uh, you know, Cynthia mentored many writers and she, uh, a lot of the comments that have been said already, I, I can't talk because they were the same things that I would have said. Some of Linda's comments, some of Leslie's comments. What I remember was always gossiping with Cynthia. There was such a pleasure to sit next to her in this book fair and talk. And I remember many mornings we woke up and had coffee together and she was reading the paper and then she'd tell me all these incredible stories. And she would gossip all the time about people. And what she was interested in was um, uh, this, this, this idea, which is at the heart of one of the pieces in Mutiny in the Mainstream, which is a panel that she organized, which is called History is Whoever Gets to the Typewriter First. And to me, that was what she was um, absolutely obsessed by. And that's why it seemed like gossip. But what she was really doing all the time was she was fact checking. She was fact checking or reality checking the um, claims that people were making about themselves. And she, all her wit and her humor and her jokes and her criticisms of people were to do with this gap between the reality of who they were and what they were really doing in the world and what they pretended that they were doing in the world. And that's what I really loved about her because she saw through people. She was a very clear judge of character, but she was also very, very aware. She was open, open, open to what was going on. She wanted to see the latest things. She wanted positive developments about women artists. She wanted new things, but she was also um, very sceptical about some of the developments in uh, feminist art history, some of the developments in the support for women artists, some of the women artists initiatives. And she did that because she wanted to see better, because she wanted to see, you know, an incredible uh, change in the world. I think she'd be very delighted now that suddenly the Tate has decided to hang you know, one third of its rooms for women, that Sao Paulo Museum decides to have a whole year dedicated to women. You know, she'd be very pleased with these developments. But equally, you know, in New York, when MoMA had five years of uh, women artists, she was very critical and she would always be critical. She had this great critical um, facility. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to say was that because of this scepticism, this is where her conviction came that other stories could be told. This gap between the facts and the claims that people made about what they were doing or other people made about what they were doing was something she always commented on. And the other thing I really want to say is that uh, Susan's pointed to this very well already. The range of her publishing work was really quite remarkable. She, she approached things with a kind of fresh eye. She tried to break conventions of publishing in very interesting ways. So to have a newsletter at a time when 
people thought there was nothing to say about women artists, but she brought together sufficient copy every month for a newsletter, you know, uh, was quite remarkable. The dictionary that she made effectively, um, which Leslie has talked about, of African-American women artists. There are no African-American women artists. Of course there are. Here is 300. We can find 300 very quickly. Um, you know, this was the kind of work that she was doing. And you can see that in the mapping of these debates in Women Artist News. Something that seems to be ephemeral, escaping all the time. If you put it in print, you can create a completely different perspective on it. And I think that that's something that she did in her publishing activities. And uh, it's something that I always talk to her about because it was something that inspired me, but I was also already walking in that direction with M. Paradoxa. So um, this is the other thing that I wanted to say. And, and Katie, I, I hope you're wrapping it up. Yes, I am. This is a final comment. And while her flat was a treasure house of all these memories and artifacts, and this was the history of her life, she was actually very reluctant to ever write her own history. And I did have conversations about whether she would ever write her own history, having said all these very skeptical things about other people's biographies. But I thought somehow that she would want her truth to come across. So I'm very pleased that we are trying to map the different parts of her life um, in this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you very much. So thank goodness Susan is here to help with the timing because I'm not any good at asking people to pause on the five minute time. I don't think I need to worry about Sandy Langer though. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. You can just do away with in. the Let's bio. Just, just like, go for it. <laughs> All right. I met Cynthia through CAA. She was one of the few New York-based arts people open to those of us living in the regions out there. In my case, Miami, Florida, and later Columbia, South Carolina. I was writing local regional criticism for the Miami Herald, Sunday Times Magazine, and Miami Magazine and Art Papers. I also started writing for Women Artists News and Elsa Fine's Women's Art Magazine as a founding member while developing a model of prismatic feminist art criticism, which uh, Arlene Raven, myself, and Joanna Fru uh, carried forward with Cynthia's inspiration. Cynthia encouraged me to join the newly emerging Women's Caucus for Art, and because of her, I hooked up um, and uh, heated the diversity committees, basically working with Faith Ringel and B. Kreloff. Cynthia was feisty, never took no for an answer, and had an edge. I remember so many conversations with her at art openings and drinks after CAA sessions. After I gave up my tenure at the University of Carolina, Columbia in the 1980s and moved back to New York, she was instrumental in encouraging me to review for arts and other publications and introduced me to a network of supportive individuals. I valued her as a colleague, a friend, and someone who always made me laugh when we got together. She was one of a kind. I wish we had had more feminists like her because she understood that we had to actively forge an alternative to the patriarchal mainstream art world in order to get our authentic feminist work out to the public. While too many wannabe feminists were breaking their humps trying to make it into the mainstream and getting beaten up, exhausted, and spit out by it, Cynthia offered the only gateway to publishing our books available. Today, so many feminists in the arts stand on her shoulders and those of others who nurtured our creativity. Cynthia was a mentor and a friend. I miss seeing and talking with her, but she always has a place in my heart. Thank, Thank you, Sandy. Sandy. Woo! Very concise. That was a mere two and a half minutes. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. You're so, going to read Howardina, right? Yes, you're going to yes. read Howardina. Uh, should we do an introduction? 
Yeah, read it, read, read it. Might as well. We... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Howard Dina was a distinguished professor, is now just appointed in 2020, distinguished professor at Stony Brook University. She received the College Art Association Lifetime Achievement Award in 2019. Mm -hmm. She has received four honorary doctorates and many awards, including the Boston University for Distinguished Service to the Profession. The reason she's not here, she is an upcoming one person show at The Shed in New York City in October. Three of her publications were published by Mid-March Arts Press. Okay, go Sandy. Okay, uh, Howard Dean, I know her well and she's a brave soul, so I'm honored to be reading this. I still remember Cynthia's smile and her laughter her love of sweets, and her warm welcome when you visited her booth. For mid-March at the CAA conferences, she sought me out to undertake several writing projects over the years. I love her book about the artist and their pets. When I, arrived, I visited her, she would always want to feed me. Once I arrived very tired and she invited me to take a nap on her couch, which I did. I love looking at her collection and wonder what will happen to it. She published Gumbo Yaya about African-American women artists. She was a pioneer. She turned down numerous awards. She left her mark and was out front and serious about artists who have been marginalized. She was one of the main innovators of the women's movement and helped to open doors for women of color. A part of me is not willing to let her go, so I cherish the memory of her smile and her generosity. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Sandy. You're working overtime here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next speaker is Douglas Shear, as Chairman Emeritus of Artists Talk on Art, which I quoted from at the beginning, from a very early session that Cynthia was part of. A painter, pioneering video artist and writer, Sheer curated the Artist Talk on Art archive of over 900 audio and video recordings featuring 7,500 artists and oversaw their placement in the archives of American art at the Smithsonian in 2016. Douglas. At last. <laughs> hey, um, I've timed myself so I know that I'm not going to exceed five minutes. Um, so I'm joining you from Woodstock, that's where I live. Uh, I knew Cynthia uh, as a fellow member of the Artist Certification Committee of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and I would see her every month at meetings in the Arsenal uh, in the, at the Central Park Zoo. Uh, that, you know, that milieu that we had in common was something sort of out of the Fred McDara uh, the artist world, which was kind of one of my Bibles as a, as a young artist. And, uh, you know, it also reflected back on my own childhood. Um, when HOA was conceived in 1974 by myself and my co-founders, Lori Antonacci and Bob Wiegand, we very soon put together a steering committee, which included Cynthia, as well as Bruce Barton, Corinne Robbins, who was a feminist critic, uh, and Irving Sandler. Later on, Cynthia and the rest of them became uh, board members of ATOA. In all, Cynthia served us for over 40 years and continued to attend board meetings until she was well in her 80s. Uh, sometimes she would come by bus. Sometimes I would drive her home out of, out of sympathy for what I knew would be a long haul for her to get home. Um, and for many years, she acted as our shadow treasurer uh, and uh, continued until we managed to get our own 501c3. It took us a long time to do that. Over the many years, mid-March would often act as our financial conduit for grants before we had our own status. But her contributions went well beyond financial planning to her influence on our programming. With her encouragement, we became much more inclusive, diverse, and pluralistic than virtually any other forum. Uh, and certainly that was far beyond what was the norm for the art world in the 1970s. She, Connie, and Lori 
all encouraged us uh, to add women to many panels. Her passion was well established because of her exposure to the club and its panels in the 50s and 60s, where she, along with Pat Pazlov, Marisol, and Louise Nevelson, were rare among female, rare female members. She, along with Irving and Bruce, fostered panels containing many abstract expressionists at ATOA, particularly in our first decade, 1975 to 85. We're now continuing, continuing, we're in our 46th year, uh, but the voices of many ABEX artists who Cynthia brought to our series can be found only in our recordings that are at Archives of American Art, because only one recording managed to survive from all the club years. Our, uh, this programming interest of hers led her and Judy Siegel uh, to do Mutiny in the Mainstream. Yes, I have a few copies. <laughs> and um, uh, we're flattered that about half of the panels that are described in the book are actually those of Artist Talk on Art. Um, Cynthia was also influential, helpful in many ways as we tried to find the appropriate uh, place to have the archive go to, uh, which we were working on. I was working on it for about 25 years. Uh, and in the last period of time when we were really seeking out institutions, uh, she, Lori Irving and Alan Coleman were all very ha uh, helpful with making contacts and, uh, and making suggestions about the archive. Um, part of Cynthia's own archive resides also at archives of American art. So because of her longevity and, and early art world experiences, which dated from the 1930s, she was really a fundamental resource. She had firsthand knowledge of the players and the events that went far beyond gossip. Uh, in fact, sometimes it would be said of her, she forgot more than you'll ever know. <laughs> uh, her knowledge of the art world was truly encyclopedic. I can speak to that. Um, and she was a great fighter. I can say that uh, in my early years with her, we often had some very interesting arguments. Uh, and one of the pleasures in my life was to know that eventually she came to respect me uh, and consider me a friend. Um, and I agree with some of the speakers who have said, she certainly deserves a lot of the credit for the substantial expansion of and the inclusion of women and women of color in museum collections and in staff positions at, at major institutions. I'll be eternally great for, grateful to Cynthia for her years of contribution to Artist Talk on Art, to her support of my own efforts, and to the art world we both came to cherish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful statement. We are running rather late on time, to say the least. Uh, but we will forge ahead and hope that our last few speakers are very concise, although they're going to be fascinating. Um, I'm not sure if we have to end at 7.30 or not. Uh, no, we don't, we Susan. Don't. Okay, super. Go ahead so to and do that. the Kim Levin thing. Kim Levin is our next speaker, and she is, uh, I believe, not here, but she is has asked me to read her statement for her. Uh, she is a major American art critic, a contributor to the Village Voice, Art News, Flash Art, Parquet, Art Studio, Sculpture, Voir. And in addition to that, she held offices at the International Association of Art Critics from 1982 until 92 in the last two years as president. She became vice president of ICA International in 1991 that's the International Art Critics Association, and was elected president in 96 for two terms, ending in 2002. So I'm gonna read her statement. Cynthia Navaretta was a unique and benevolent force in the art community. In terms of the International Association of Art Critics, Cynthia was always there, always keenly observant, always low key, always fearless. She gave me much excellent advice during my years as international president of ICA. 
She was one of the few members of ICA USA who participated in international conferences during those years. She was at the Congress in Belfast, Japan, and Sweden. And she was at the Congress in Croatia two weeks after 911, when most American and British participants and speakers had canceled in fear. I was one of those cancellations. Mid-March Press also published the papers given at the 1990, 1991 Congress in Santa Monica, co-organized by myself and our late colleague, Merle Shipper, for which I am eternally grateful. That publication, Beyond Walls and Wars, Art, Politics, and Multiculturalism, included speakers from almost all the former Soviet satellite states, as well as from countries such as Syria and Senegal. Cynthia immediately offered to publish it without ever having been asked. That was another of her greatest strengths. Thank you, Kim. And it, I thought it was really important to have the international perspective in addition to all the other amazing accomplishments which, uh, which we're hearing about. So our next speaker is, is uh, Rico Takata. And she is an artist who's lived and worked in the San Francisco Bay Area all her life, which is currently on fire. After attending the Academy of Art College, she has exhibited her art both nationally and internationally. Rico. Hi. Um, yes. Let's see. Sorry. I met Cynthia over 20 years ago. I was on the WCA Women's Caucus for Arts National Board, and our mutual friend, the late great artist and feminist June Wayne, invited us all out for a fine Italian feast. Cynthia loved her Italian food and her Italian in men. In the cab home, after agreeing that we must stay in touch, oops, I realized that I hadn't brought my cards and said, well, don't you think that's refreshingly unself-promotional? <laughs> that look of hers, chin up, eyebrows raised, pursed lips, before she replied, no, dear, I think that's stupid. <laughs> We've been in touch ever since. With Cynthia, just like her niece said, you always got the unvarnished truth. Later, I was lucky to be invited to stay every year during CAA with others like Katie Deepwell. And with a home full of guests, it felt like a dorm of artistic sisters in Cynthia's artistic jewel box of a home. Of course, Cynthia was the jewel. She and her husband hosted grand artist gatherings and receptions. They decided to host an evening, introducing a promising West Coast writer to their New York circle. Later, as Cynthia was cleaning up, she found the guest of honor passed out under the dining room table. With great effort, they got the wobbly man into a cab and Jack Kirouac made it safely home that evening. <laughs> Like Jack, I was invited back, and I eventually helped her at her CAA book both, especially after the death of her trusted assistant, Daniel Demers. It was a rare pleasure and educational journey to be with her at that CAA book fair with all the revolving, wonderful, interesting characters. Our bo booth at the fair was put together with spit, staples, tape, and anything else we could scavenge from her home because she was so thrifty, she didn't like to buy much. Have you ever received a letter from Cynthia? She hated waste and often reused her envelopes in very creative ways. Yet she was so generous in other ways, her support of artists and writers was unwavering. She came to every single opening New York show I was in, braving the New York buses in her walker and colorful scarves. She came to one opening early, and after being told that the price list, the price list was not yet ready, I can only imagine her fixing that glare on the man and saying, and yes, how exactly do you plan to sell the work without a price list? <laughs> Quite a few years ago, the WCA wanted to give Cynthia a Lifetime Achievement Award for her activism, and tireless work securing artists and writers' work into the historical record. She turned it down. <laughs> what? I begged her to accept. Still, she refused. 
She didn't like the spotlight. And I think it was Cynthia herself who was selfless, giving, and refreshingly unself-promotional. Two years ago, I organized a special event, a meet and greet for Mid-March and Cynthia in her art-filled home with the help of my friend, Helen Poole, and Cynthia's devoted and kind caregiver, Elsie Menard. We laid out all of the Mid-March Arts Press books for all to peruse. Cynthia held court, graciously gave a short talk, answered questions, and hosted a truly memorable evening for all, probably her last party. Luckily, no one passed out under the table. <laughs> so anyway, dear Cynthia, dear mentor, dear teacher, it was never more true that they really broke that mold when they made you. A thousand memories keep you in my thoughts. Thank Ooh. you. Thank you, Rico. That was terrific. Yes, thank you, Rico. Wow. Whew, this is such an exciting event. We go to another wonderful presenter, Eloise. Eloise, I'm afraid, how do I pronounce your last name? Uh, you're muted. Schottler. Schottler, thank you. Eloise is a storyteller, a collage artist, and a local cable performer and host in the DC area where she tells original stories and interviews, interviews interesting people, mostly women. In 1972, Cynthia and I met in Washington at the first National Gathering for Women Artists. Whoops, sorry. She was a grand mentor for me as a new activist for women artists. Okay, Eloise, you're on. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really so happy to be here, you know, and to hear all your stories. I'm really an outsider from this because I wasn't working down in the New York area or coming for quite a long time, but I didn't lose track with Cynthia because I couldn't, you know. I mean, it was just an impossible thing. And because we're time, you know, loose, I'm gonna just go to the back and tell you what I think I wanted to tell you about because I don't think she told anyone. In 1985, the UN had a conference and the, for women all over the world, that was gonna be the one and they wanted to have that one in Nairobi, Kenya. And so I was talking to Cynthia, we talked regularly on the phone, and we sort of um, had a similarity in the things that we would want and do. And so she said, we have to take our women to Africa to have their artwork seen at that conference. I said, I think you're nuts. And she said, no, I'm not nuts. And we're gonna figure out how to do it and we'll bring Nancy Cusick in with us. And there'll be three of us that will get that done. And we split it into three jobs. Cynthia would get the artwork, the artwork from the galleries that would go down. She would find them, she would borrow them, you know. It, you, we had no money. Uh, I would do the ones where I gathered um, artwork from people artists in the country who sent me their art and we had 330 pieces to take from people in the country and nancy made some beautiful sort of post op post church some charts that she could hang freely in different places and we could spread out we went it was extremely startling because i joined her Nancy and I came up from Washington, D.C., and we hadn't seen anything that Cynthia had. And the next day, when we got off of the Air Kenya plane in Nairobi, she had this enormous clothing thing like you have down on the streets in, in New York. And it was tall, and it was rolling, and it was filled with artwork that she had borrowed from galleries in New York. She didn't pay them anything. She just offered and promised she'd bring it back. There was a Georgia O'Keeffe, there was a Louise Nevelson, and they, I don't remember the whole list. Nancy had seen that we had the end of a, of a hallway uh, in a hotel and we hung it up there. 
And then I had my notebooks and we put them out and we had the whole thing. It was wonderful. Cynthia was prepared. We had press passes around our necks so that we could go to anything there and appear that we were, you know, serious and that we were journalists and that we were there for what knows, I don't know. This went on for about a week. And one night at supper, she and I were sitting down and she said, we've missed the best thing here. And I said, what are you talking about? We've missed the best thing here. She said, we haven't seen the animals. <gasps> we haven't. I want to see the animals. How are we going to see the animals? And we solved that by going to a little service and signing up for a three-day safari. And so we went on a safari. The man came in a, you know, a thing where the, you could open the top and stand up when you got into the seat where the animals were independently on their own arranging themselves and standing. Wow. It was amazing. We were on uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, not all the way up, just sort of far enough to say, I've been on the ar Mount Kilimanjaro. That was always a novel in my mind, but it's more than that. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary experience with those animals and with seeing them. And especially the night that we went to dinner at uh, a pavilion where we were staying and there was a fire pit in the center and the flames were coming up because it was cold. And we went out, Cynthia and I stood at the edge of the, of the stones and we looked up into the sky. It was so dark and there were only diamonds in that sky. Uh, stars, stars that made the Milky Way. Whew. Can't forget things like that. Wow. They were so beautiful. And we talked about it all the way back. And then we talked about it for years. And you probably don't know that she was quite ill the last two days that we were in Nairobi. And we had to, I had to bring her back without, with a doctor's approval because there was no seat available for her to come home for over two weeks. Oh my God. Yeah, she was so brave and cons it was wonderful and such a relief that she was back in the States. And we talked about that from time to time and she never wanted to talk about it. But I thought that was such courage that yeah. she was there, she saw everybody, she did everything. And I loved her immediately from the first day I met her. We were more Equal Rights Amendment uh, together. I was- Thank, thank you so much, Eloise. Eloise, that was a fabulous story. Can you yeah. remind us what year it was that you went to uh, Kenya? 1985. 85, that's really important to hear. One of wonderful story, thank you. Our, next, our final speaker is Carrie Grimsby, uh, who has played a major role in organizing our event, including that slideshow. She's a fine art photographer and web designer who lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She's taught photography, digital imaging, and web design at the School of Visual Arts in Ramapo College of New Jersey and at community centers and after school programs in Kit Pittsburgh. Carrie worked as an intern at Midmarch Arts Press in the late 1990s and maintains the Midmarch website, which I just checked and it's beautiful. Uh, so you can just look it up, midmarchartsbooks.org. Carrie. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to read this. Um, I met Cynthia in 1996 as an intern at Midmarch Arts Press. She was 73 years old then retired from architectural engineering and full steam into publishing. I had no idea how old she was. She literally looked exactly the same to me for most of the 20 years that I knew her. I originally contacted Cynthia after seeing a listing for interns that was probably from the 80s, Xeroxed several times over and filed away in the library at Ithaca College. When I arrived at her apartment, I liked Cynthia immediately and I was impressed by the books and magazines she published. 
We sat at her dining room table with a beautiful view of the Hudson River outside her window and her collection of abstract art all around the room. I'm a cat person. And during our first meeting, one of Cynthia's eight Siamese cats jumped right up onto my lap. Impressed by this, Cynthia told me this particular cat was normally standoffish with strangers. I think this helped me get the job. <laughs> As Cynthia's intern, I had various editorial and writing duties. I learned the most, however, by watching and hearing Cynthia run her business. Listening to her conduct calls, observing her careful editing practices, and listening to her plans for completing projects taught me so much about pursuing one's interests and passions wisely, but with abandon. Cynthia had a huge dictionary on a pedestal in her dining room. While copy editing, she would often pause to look up words and think about their meaning before committing to them. This made an impression on me because I was always a little insecure about my language skills and her, her willingness as an older person, as a publisher, to look up a word to truly understand it was admirable. She would met also meticulously record every task and conversation she had in a small diary and could specifically reference back to it when needed. She reused postage stamps that hadn't been canceled out and both sides of every piece of paper to run her nonprofit. While sorting through the images to be included in each book, Cynthia's fascination with the material and artists was infectious. Drawing from her own knowledge and vast archive of materials on women artists, she had more to contribute to any author's work. As a career woman, Cynthia was a role model for me of the kind of life women can choose to have. She assured me that no one made this easy for her. She told me the architectural firm where she had worked placed a, a male secretary who was gay with Cynthia, assuming this would make her unhappy. Instead, Cynthia said she and her secretary were very friendly and worked happily together for years. She didn't forget attempts like these to undermine her position as a female professional, but she also didn't let this stop her or discourage her. Cynthia was a true New Yorker in every best sense. Tough, smart, Worldly, energetic, energetic, curious, and fair. Witnessing her lifestyle, privileged and highly educated, was eye-opening for me. None of my grandparents had the opportunity to attend college, nor did my mother. Their lives were focused on family and home. Cynthia focused on her publishing work every day, from morning until night. She worked to get as much information out into the world about artists and movements, and especially the women involved in those movements, as possible. Cynthia consciously functioned as a citizen of the world, contributing her talents and interests, and did all of this from her own dining room. Cynthia supported my efforts to find a publishing job. While working at the CAA conference with Cynthia, I walked around the book fair and handed my resume to about 20 different publishers resulting in an editorial position at McGraw-Hill. She remained a cheerleader to me throughout my pursuit of an MFA. When I had my thesis show in 2002, Cynthia was there. I continued to work for her from time to time when she needed help into the 2000s. Whenever I returned to her apartment, it felt very much the same. I would often find old post-it notes I had put on the, computer, on the computer monitor in her spare room years before. When I moved... <laughs> When I moved to Pittsburgh, she was the only person to say that she didn't understand why I left New York City and gave up my position as an adjunct professor. I didn't think I was giving anything up, but with a three-year-old and a 14-month-old child, the change in location certainly set my career back. I appreciated her candor about this and her acknowledgement of how difficult our, our culture makes things for women still today. I know I briefly met several of Cynthia's friends at the CAA conference in New York in 1997. One of you told me to be entrepreneurial in my pursuit of a career. This advice and Cynthia's energy and strength has remained with me all of these years. I'm so grateful to have had this time with all of you to re remember and appreciate the unforgettable force that Cynthia was. Rest in peace, Cynthia. Thank you for everything you gave the world. I'll miss you. Oh, thank, thank you, Carrie. We give you a hug. If I was there, I would hug you in person. We have one little speaker added in. Matthew, are you available to say a few words? 
Matthew Kangas. Let's see if he's still here. Maybe he gave up. I don't know. There's people have left the meeting. I, it's just the nature yeah, of these things. Me, I can check if he's here. You can hear me now, right? Ah, oh, good. Where are you? I'm right here. Are you on a camera? Uh, let's see. Oh, there. Judy, can we find her? Him? Him? Matthew? Hi, can you hear me? We there can. He there is. we are. There. Hey. There he is. Through Seattle. Um, this has been so uh, uh, such an important event to have, and Susan is in Seattle too, of course, but you know, it's been very New York centric and global in a way, but I wanted to stress the global reach of, of Cynthia's activities and especially her uh, role in American art history. Um, she, okay, now she's in the archives of American art, but really she contributed to American art history, especially uh, with the West Coast and um, Canadian artists and um, in addition to women artists, other people. I just, just on a personal level, I want to give Laura Brunsman a lot of credit. She was the editor of uh, Modernism and Beyond uh, Women Artists of the Pacific Northwest, to which I contributed. It was through her uh, that I met uh, Cynthia and began writing for Women Artists News. Well, all it took was a week in Paris together with Cynthia uh, at the ICA conference. It was supposed to be in the Ivory Coast, but they had a little civil war, so we all went to Paris instead, and then she and I stayed on the following week. Our, our hotels were a couple of doors apart from one, and we'd have dinner every night, and by the end of the week, she said, well, why don't we publish some collections of your writing? So that led to like four separate books over a 10-year over a period that really, I mean, put Seattle on the map. I, I'd like to think I was already on the map, but thanks to her, she made an enormous contribution to to the art history of this region. And uh, she never questioned for a minute uh, the validity or the significance of these artists or the other artists who were involved with American craft, uh, whom I had also written about. So, you know, I too, I'd stay in Miles's bedroom uh, when I came to New York. And she was uh, one of the, the two most inspiring people I've ever met in my life as in the art world. And um, I dare say she was the most influential. Um, the other person was a New Yorker too, and I'll, I'll leave on that note. His name was Clement Greenberg. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, that, thank you very much, Matthew. That was a very important contribution because I mentioned in the books about the regional interest, and it wasn't just the Northwest. It was also California and Texas, and she right. reached out. Uh, as she did for everybody, way ahead of her time. Now, Helen Poole, if we have a minute, she said she wanted to make a brief comment about the film that she made of Cynthia's apartment at the time of the celebration of Cynthia, which was, as Rico said, Cynthia's final party. So I think it would be good for Helen to be our concluding brief speaker. Thank you, Helen. Well, I, I would love to post more photos and videos on the group on Facebook, if that remains up. And I just wanted to say the very last morning I stayed at her house that weekend for three nights, um, she and I had a very intimate conversation in her bedroom. And it wasn't about her work or the art world. It was more about each of our lives. We shared very intimate stories. And I was so struck by the view she had, and I asked her about it. And she spoke about loving her home and that view and appreciating it every day she lived there. And at one point she said, I've had a full life. I've had a good life. Beautiful. Thank you. That's Cynthia perfect. Was a thank you. Oh, thank you. Perfect ending to our event. And uh, I'm going to thank you all for participating and for listening. It's been a very special afternoon. We're going to show the slideshow one more time at the end, but I won't be speaking again. So you can feel comfortable if you want to leave, if you've seen the slideshow, or you can see it again if you want to.